Hey guys, what's up? It's The Culture Detective here, investigating your favorite animes, and today I'm going to do another anime review on an anime that I recently finished. I finished it yesterday, and um, it is the latest Sonny Boy. Sonny Boy is an original anime written and directed by Natsume Shingo, and it is produced under Studio Madhouse. And it is uh, an anime that only recently ended. And by recently, I mean in early October. It just ended in early October. And uh, I've been hearing things about Sonny Boy left and right. You know, how interesting the pilot episode was and how interesting its style was. But not a lot about its plot. But uh, curiosity got the better of me. I watched Sonny Boy and... Um, where do I even begin? Where do I even begin? So Sunny Boy is an anime about how one day in uh, school, all of the students inside were transported to a different world. The school is still here and all the students are here, but all the teachers are gone and there is no outside world. Everything else is just a black void. It's just an abyss. And together they must help each other to find out how to leave this world and return to their uh, original world, aka the real world. And that's basically the plot. But to say that this is the plot and the premise of the anime is completely missing the point because this anime isn't even about it. And um, needless to say, this is probably the most abstract and experimental anime I've ever seen. Also probably one of the most abstract and experimental piece of cinema I've ever seen. Before I dive deeper into the plot of this anime, I would like to talk about the technical stuff first. First of all, I love the art style. So apparently Natsume Shingo also worked on other projects like One Punch Man and uh, for some reason uh, I don't know where that I hear this, but she, uh, he also worked for Kon Satoshi in the making of Perfect Blue and other animes that's done by Kon Satoshi. So obviously the art style of Sonny Boy is clean. It's crisp. It's not fancy or anything. It's very plain, but it is the simplicity, the simplicity that really sells the art style for me. It's just so plain and real and it's just very humane and grounded in a sense. I also really like the fact that this anime doesn't have an opening sequence because again, this anime is um, not like any other animes you have ever seen in your entire life. This anime is not supposed to be a narrative experience or anything. It's not supposed to be fancy or emotional or anything. So. The fact that it doesn't have an opening sequence is great. It also doesn't have an ending sequence. It has end credits. It has an end credit song by the uh, Ging Nang Boys, I think. I forgot to mention that uh, the soundtrack for this anime also involves Taiwanese rock band Sunset Roller Coaster and Midair Thief, one of my favorite musical acts hailing from South Korea right now. I just revealed uh, their album, uh, his album, not too long ago and gave it a 10 out of 10. So uh, it is such a pleasant surprise that Midair Thief would make an appearance in this anime. It's kind of awesome, actually. But uh, yeah, it doesn't have an ending sequence, per se. Not only that, this anime is very silent. The entire episode 1 is completely musicless. It has diegetic noise, but the whole episode doesn't have any music, aside from the end credit song. And I really love it because out of all the animes I've seen so far in my entire life, most of the animes suffer from the same issue, and that is uh, it has too much music, too much dramatic music to accompany dramatic scenes. And music is a very powerful tool in cinema. Music is extremely powerful and it cannot be abused. And I think Sonny Boy perfectly understands that. It is ultimately up to the audience for interpreting the anime. This anime doesn't have a clear answer. Why are the students adrift? 
Why are they sent to a different world? Why do some students have superpowers? Why do some others don't? What is the meaning of all this? How do they get out? There are no real answers. It's all up for interpretation. It's all up to the audience to figure it out themselves. Or instead of figuring it out, feel it out. Because it, there's no way we can figure it out. Because it's just so confusing and abstract. Ultimately, it all builds up to a point of meaningless and nothingness where we realize that trying to find out answers, trying to understand this anime is futile. It is futile. It is pointless. But anyways, I digress. This anime has its fair share of inspirations all the way from the English novel Lord of the Fly to the manga The Drifting Classroom, the TV show Lost, and also apparently a French novel written in the late 19th century called A Two-Year Vacation. And, uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna go through this anime episode by episode, but even so, I probably would not be able to touch on every single topic explored in this anime. This anime is kind of like an onion. It has so many layers to peel, and it is pointless for me to dissect this. I feel like I'm not smart enough to dissect an anime like this, nor do I have the time and the energy to really dissect every single element of this anime. I feel like sometime in the future, Sonny Boy is going to turn into like a cold classic with a cold following, and there's going to be like a three hour long, four hour long video essay exploring every themes explored in Sunny Boy. Kind of like how um, there's this YouTuber who made a four hour long video essay explaining Twin Peaks, which is crazy, but uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly impressive. Now, maybe I'm reading into this anime a little bit too hard. Maybe Natsume Shingo made this anime for fun. Maybe it's just experimentation. Maybe it's not meant to have a story or anything. But then at the same time, you have to admit there are so many deeper themes and ideas explored in this anime that is without a doubt intentional, intentionally placed. So what is this anime anyways? What am I even looking at? What am I even trying to understand? Now, the first three episodes are pretty slow paced, but for an anime with this very real and almost meditative style, I think it is perfect pace for the anime. And in the beginning, uh, usually in an anime, there's a hero and there's a villain. So in the beginning, I actually had no idea what kind of anime I'm getting into. So I was trying to figure out who's going to be the villain. So at first, we have uh, authoritarianism. The school is sent to the void and the student council wants to control the entirety of the rest of the school and have them follow these rules because it's supposed to keep the peace. And at first it sounds like a good idea and then it sort of turns into authoritarianism. It turns into totalitarianism. And so maybe the student council are the villains. Except after they are being toppled and are sent to a different world which is the beach, the island where pretty much the rest of the anime takes place on, where we realize that maybe they are not supposed to be the villains. The villain is this girl called Mizuho, whose voice actress is Aoi Yuki, who is a very talented voice actress. Mizuho is apparently responsible for setting things on blue fire and destroying them. But turns out she is innocent. The blue fire is only a rule of the world. If you take something without giving something back, that something will turn into blue fire and burn and be destroyed. And every world has rules. And yes, every world. Because the characters in this anime will soon jump from world to world to world to world. So every world has its own rules. And so on episode 3, we have another rule where if you are being left out, if nobody remembers you, if nobody cares about you, you're going to be secluded. And I am back. Where did I last leave off? I had to cut off my review in the middle just so that I could uh, get clothes out of the drying machine. But anyways, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> so much for drying. Anyways, uh, 
people who feel secluded, people who don't belong there, are surrounded by black curtains and are turned to stone. And they can go missing for days, they can go missing for weeks, and people would not notice. And this is another episode that has a, sort of a more underlying meaning behind it about people being left out, people who are not remembered, people who don't leave anything behind, not a memory, not not a memory, not not something tangible, nothing. And uh, I think this is a really important message about not only um, caring about people who are secluded and and feel ostracized, but also the working culture and the social culture of Japan in general. But anyways, we have episode 4, where in the middle of the episode, one of the characters, who are supposedly uh, an evil, power-hungry authoritarian on episode 1, who basically has come to terms with himself and has become more of a kind person, he basically spends like 6-7 minutes in the middle of episode 4 just talking about this story about how the island magically has a bunch of monkeys an entire kingdom, an entire empire of monkeys. And they aren't just any monkeys, they are baseball monkeys. They play baseball. And apparently this is a huge and somewhat complex and strange anatomy about how people take everything too seriously and make anything and everything into competitions when in fact they should have just played the game casually because it is the game and there is no need for the game to become too competitive and the game as if it is um, a metaphor for life. If you want to live life competitively, you are missing out on the true meaning of life. Life is about living. Life is not about winning and it is about living and I think that's what ultimately this baseball monkey story tells us. Again, it's all speculation because it's just so abstract. On episode 4, we have this character called Ace, and he challenged uh, Nagara, our main character, to a game of baseball, which Nagara had lost because he's bad at baseball. But uh, it wasn't like an epic defeat. It wasn't like a dramatic defeat. Okay, so I kind of forgot to uh, introduce the main characters, but essentially we have our main character, Nagara, who is a regular boy who is kind of shy, introverted, and very passive and conformist. And uh, most people in the story have superpowers, but superpowers isn't really the point in the story or anything. It is not really a main dish if this anime is a is a three course or even a five course meal superpowers would merely be a side dish in like the appetizer or anything because the superpowers in this anime they are really really weird you know it's not like your average superpowers you know like super strength super speed telekinesis whatever superpowers in sunny boy are superpowers like being able to speak to god or, or hearing God's voice, creating new worlds, exiting worlds, and finding death, creating matters out of nowhere, and creating concepts and ideas. These superpowers are super abstract and as intangible and as ununderstandable, incomprehensible as it can ever get. So Nagara at first doesn't seem to have a superpower or anything, but after figuring things out, he realized that his superpower is to be able to teleport into a different world. And the world is called this world, Kono Sekai, which means this world. And um, Nagara thought his power is to be able to teleport to a different world, while Nozomi, with uh, the short brunette hair, uh, she has a very strange power, and that is to be able to see a light from a far distance. And she doesn't really understand her power all that well, but essentially she believed that this light guides her and everyone else to the exit of this world. Maybe to another this world, maybe to the real world, we don't know. 
Mitsuho is a bit of an outcast girl who is mean, but who has a lot of feelings inside, of course, and her power is to be able to order anything with Nyamazon because she has three cats, and those three cats are also adrift with Mitsuho, the owner. And what happens is that Mitsuho can order anything. She could order a house, a castle, a bed, food, a, a smartphone. She can order anything. As long as it's real, as long as it exists in real life, she can order it. So she can tell the cats to order things and it would just happen. And then we have Rajani who is an Indian boy and she, uh, he is easily the most intelligent character of the entire story. And um, he is the person responsible for uh, trying to figure out how to leave this world. And he would create a lot of gadgets, a lot of tools, he would design a lot of things, and he is just super smart. Another character is Hoshi, who is a part of the student council. And uh, he's called Hoshi because he has a star on his face. And what he does is that he hears God. He hears God. And he doesn't tell anyone else that he's able to hear God until like episode 5, but he hears God. And God knows what happens in the future. So Hoshi knows what happens in the future. And another character is uh, Asakaze, who is a person who can warp time and space. And his power gradually becomes more and more powerful until the very, very end of the anime. So uh, there's that. But Asakaze is arrogant and rude and selfish. And he loves Nozomi, but ultimately he wants to be the hero. He wants to play hero. He wants to play god. And so on episode 5, we are introduced to a new character called uh, Aki-sensei, Mrs. Aki or Miss Aki, who is supposedly a teacher from the school, except that is weird because only students of the school could enter this world, not teachers. So this must be a student in disguise. But anyways, Aki-sensei was this really uh, big boo woman who is uh, super mean and aggressive and she basically tells everyone to stay wherever they are and don't return to the real world, but instead serve the god who turns out to be the principal of the school. But uh, this is one of those occasions where it really reminds me of Lost, like how in Lost we have the main gang and then we have the others and both sides are just as unbelievable as they are believable and trustable. And that's what I really love about stories like this. But but then again, this whole Aki-sensei thing isn't even the main dish. In fact, the whole anime doesn't have a main dish. It is like a collection of ideas and thoughts scattered across this really strange and ever-evolving predictions, contradicting, expectations, subverting line of consciousness that is just incredibly hard to decode. Now we have episode 6, the halfway finale for Sonny Boy. It is called The Long Goodbye and it, it is easily one of the best, if not the best episodes of the entire anime of 12 episodes. And it is also one of the most out of body experiences I've had in anime this year. It is just a very powerful episode that highlights um, absurdism, if anything. Uh, absurdism is a concept, is a philosophical concept uh, written and, and I guess coined by French philosopher Albert Camus and I'm not a philosophy expert or anything but from what I've known absurdism is an idea that you try your very best to find the meaning of this world, to understand this world but the more you understand this world the more you realize that there is nothing to understand because there is so much chaos and mayhem and confusion to a point where you realize that trying to understand the world is meaningless. It is pointless to begin with. There is no point in anything that you do, in anything that I do, in anything that he does or she does. There is no point in anything. So in this case, your best course of action is to commit suicide. Or, instead of commit suicide, just live without any goals 
or purposes in life. And I think episode 6 just perfectly captures that. It is um, like finding a goal, finding a purpose. Maybe we can get back to the real world. And then once it reaches that point, we are slammed back to the real world just to realize that nothing means anything. And it's such an out-of-body, mind-shattering experience. That's also really beautiful because music is used. Given that this anime has so much silence, whenever music is used, it becomes powerful. And in this episode 6, in the final bits, we have this a school song, school anthem bit that is kind of melancholic and kind of like a goodbye. And we finally meet God, the principal. And the principal shows up and says that there is no meaning in all of this. That there are students who are adrift, who are teleported to other worlds simply because of a roll of a dice. It's all probability. It doesn't mean anything. And uh, yeah, it's dark, it's sad, it's thought-provoking, it is life-affirming, defirming, whatever that means. And the rest of the anime only progresses to be even more abstract because from episode 7 on, we realize that it is basically impossible to go back to the real world. So there is no point in anything. Anything could happen. Anything could not happen. We are into new territories that we cannot predict. But on episode 7, we have the episode Road Book, which is, I think, my second favorite episode of the entire anime. It is um, when uh, Nagara teleported to a whole new world where all of the characters are different and we are trapped in a world where we have a bunch of students who live every single day to build the Tower of Babel in the hopes that the Tower of Babel will finally reach heaven and somehow reaching heaven is going to bring them back to the real world and it is it is heart-wrenching to be honest so I think a couple episodes before that we are introduced to a dog a black dog and uh, he is of course voiced by none other than Mr. Tsuda Kenjiro uh, the deep voice anime man and one of the elites is the umbrella man who is an umbrella but also a bat and he can turn worlds upside down that is his ability he finds Nagara and brings Nagara to a different world where they're building the Tower of Babel except that they're building it downwards and nobody questions why nor anybody believes in the Tower of Babel so when Nagara was transported to that world I was actually really impressed like I thought the anime would spend a couple episodes in this world and be like there and, and and just be more ambitious than I thought it is you know how in Mushoku Tensei towards the end the main characters are transported to a different continent and I'm like wow maybe the story is so much more ambitious than I had expected same effect pretty much happens here except Nagara pretty much returns on the same episode but what happens is that Nagara is sent to the Tower of Babel and he meets people there who has been working for over 200 years already and every single day they wake up they eat worms and they move stones to the very bottom and that's it that's all they do every single day for 200 years and um, ultimately Nagara made friends with uh, another person and that person told him that he knows that this Tower of Babel is bullshit it doesn't work there's no way out there is no heaven there may not even be a god but it doesn't matter because it at least gives him a purpose to live and when I scroll through reddit to find people discussing this anime on episode 7 one of the users even like quoted Karl Marx and uh, basically uh, what Karl Marx says is that we have the lower class and then we have the upper class, the elites. And what happens is that the elites create a religion so that the lower class would have enough motivation and enough purpose to move on with life, to continue doing whatever they're doing. Manufacturing, farming, living, whatever. Just serving the purpose of stabilizing the structure, the socio-economic structure of the whole world. And the, elite, and the elites, they just sit back and they create this religion. 
And so, uh, again, this episode is just gut-wrenching because ultimately it is about false hope. It is about living a life based on hope that isn't even real. Yeah, episode 8 is where we have a flashback for the dog character, ya, uh, Yaba Miko. And it is uh, an episode about regrets and loss. And again, uh, somebody on Reddit basically quoted uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, the philosopher, for the episode uh, for the, with the idea that uh, God is dead. And again, similar themes being explored. The purpose of life, the purpose of following orders, the purpose of living life for a higher purpose. And because the dog character, Yamabiko, is such a nihilist and conformist, he is not able to save the people around him. And everybody around him died of a plague where their bodies slowly turn into red gems. And um, it's dark, it's sad, it's depressing, and um, it's very thought-provoking, I guess, at the very least. And what happens is that we have a character called Soa Seiji, and his power is to be able to reverse everything. And because of his power, God sent Miss Aki and Asakaze to kill him. And to kill him, what happened is that there is a double of Soul Seiji, which led him to believe that this double is his long lost twin. And because of this identity crisis, he wants to kill his twin. But to kill his twin, he kills himself. And it's been hundreds of years where they have battled, where the twins have battled, when in fact they're not twins, they're just themselves. But if one of them loses, the other loses still. So if one of them dies, the other dies. And that is how their existences are pretty much erased in the story. And then we have episode 10, which is uh, another really um, bleak episode where Asakaze and Miss Aki are on their way to kill War, the same character that showed up in uh, the dog's flashbacks a couple episodes ago. And War is so much different in this episode. He is an empty man, a hollow man with no thoughts and thinking. So we are also introduced to this character, Tsubasa, who can read minds, but forever lives with a broken arm. And what happens is that we have this love triangle of Tsubasa loving Asakaze and Asakaze loving Nozomi and Asakaze being controlled by his uh, lust and uh, because Aki-sensei is such a hot woman that Asakaze and also Asakaze really wanting to play hero, really wanting to be the savior of the world, he basically followed Aki-sensei and God aka principles words to do whatever they want and uh, yeah, in a sense, it's almost like Aki-sensei is the a personification of the devil, working with God for some reason. But ultimately, I feel like Aki-sensei and Azakaze are just examples of how religions drive people to extremes. We have the return of Rajani, who has been living for 2,000 years already and has become one with the nature. At the very end of the anime, it is implied that he has become the Buddha, like he has reached Buddhist enlightenment and has become a hollow shell. He has finally understood the meaning of life and that is there's no meaning in life. Life is nothing. We are only walking pieces of meat. Our thoughts and our consciousness are only results of a bunch of physical reactions and chemical reactions. We are nothing and it's all right because because that's life because that is nature and Rajani has reached that point and he has become a Buddha. He has become a statue. He has become someone with nothing inside, but in a good way. In a way, he is fulfilled. And uh, yeah, episode 12 is uh, where, uh, I guess spoiler alert, but it wouldn't even matter. And that is Nagara and Mitsuho returned to real life. And uh, we are told that Aki-sensei and everyone else uh, basically died. And again, that only feeds the idea of how a lot of these religious people thinking that religion is the ultimate answer will only be disappointed when they finally learn 
that there is no meaning. And the only way to escape this meaninglessness is death. And so they all volunteered to die. And what's beautiful and also damning about this ending is that reality has never been more real. And reality has never been more meaningless. But what's different from the life before the drifting and after is that this time Nagara smiled. Because he finally understood that life is meaningless then and all he needs to do is to live, he found comfort in that. He doesn't need to search for a higher purpose anymore. Just live in the moment and be himself as he is supposed to in this great universe that spans over billions of years with so many people and so many stories to tell. Ultimately, his story is nothing, is, is nothing but as a speck. And he realizes that and he's comfortable with it. And that is something that even I myself, a 19 year old, cannot fully grasp yet, but I just really appreciate how this anime tackled the meaning of life and nothingness, pointlessness, absurdism, nihilism. And um, yeah. <sighs> wow. Um, I know it is really weird, but uh, I feel like it would be disrespectful and it would be sinful to not give this anime a 10 out of 10. Wow. So, have you watched Sonny Boy? From 1 to 10, how much did you rate it? Like it, like it, and subscribe if you want more. And thanks for watching. Maybe at some point in the future, I'm going to do a video essay on this anime. Who knows?